views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Welcome to Public Health America, a weekly program produced by BronxNet in partnership with Mercy College. I'm your host, Dr. William Latimer. Here on Public Health America, we speak with experts from an array of specialties across the liberal arts and health professions to provide you with not only the best science, but practical tips to live a healthier life. We also celebrate what studies have long documented, namely the unparalleled value of a liberal arts college education by setting the stage to pursue a career of your choice, increase lifetime earnings, and engage in civil debate. Our experts will share decisions they made and support they received that helped them to beat the odds. By sharing one or two life lessons, their stories may provide you with the inspiration and method to realize your dreams. This is Public Health America. Welcome to Public Health America. I'm your host, Dr. William Latimer. It's a pleasure to welcome today our guest, Dr. Talar Markosian, Associate Professor of Public Health Sciences, Health Policy and Management at Loyola University, Chicago. Welcome, Talar. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Our pleasure, my pleasure. So I know you've been doing some cutting edge work on various healthcare models uh, to improve the public health, keeping vulnerable populations in mind. Uh, and looking closely at value. Uh, tell us a little bit about your work. Yeah, so I'm a, I'm, my focus is in health policy and management, and my dissertation work actually was on cost-effectiveness analysis of a program at the time, it was patient navigation program to improve cancer health outcomes disparities. And since then, I, I focused the, my research on health outcome disparities and seeing how different populations have access to healthcare and what's the implications of that on cancer outcomes. That's where I started. And I was looking at the rural urban differences as well because I was located in a rural setting. And then since I moved to Loyola, I've partnered with one of our physicians who does research in chronic kidney disease. And uh, if you guys know, have a background in chronic kidney disease, it's a growing disease and it has several comorbidities that are associated that lead kind of like the where people start and that would lead to chronic, uh, to chronic kidney disease like hypertension, obesity, diabetes. And if you might, if you have the background, you would see those are really common problems in the US. And that's where we moved. We look at disparities in these outcomes and why. And we started the next step. What can we do to improve these outcomes? Great. So you've you've laid it out very nicely and, and have set the table for some of the questions I was thinking of asking. So you mentioned populations, rural versus urban was one. Maybe talk to us a little bit about are there differences between rural and urban populations in terms of disease risk and how they interface with uh, healthcare agencies? Is that a piece of what you looked at in terms of that difference? Yeah, that was when I was located in uh, at the university in rural Georgia. And that's where we looked at and it was specific to cancer outcomes and more specifically to breast cancer and colorectal co outcomes. And at the time, we looked at cancer registry data to see how, we, uh, at least like I'm going to speak for breast cancer, that it's not very different than colorectal cancer. And we wanted to see how women uh, have different incidence for breast cancer based on urban rural uh, location, race and ethnicity and interaction. And later on in, in, uh, in some papers, we looked at the accessibility 
of healthcare services in an area like the percent of primary care physicians and internal medicine physicians, those are physicians who probably are going to do the mammograms and physicians who do oncology surgery and see how that impacted the choice of treatment that women had and the outcomes that they were experiencing. So there is research and actually it's been a while that they have looked. So for example, if you're located in a rural area and if you're more uh, African-American of origin, you're more likely to get mastectomies versus other ter uh, sort of treatment. And that would have implications because there are other treatment that could have better outcomes and better quality of life. So it's not like it's the quality of the treatment you receive as well as the outcomes that you experience. That was very, again, nicely laid out. Um, were there other, so African-American women were having a, a higher incidence of mastectomy and some of that may have been unnecessary is what I think you're saying. Were there other differences between rural and urban or uh, racial ethnic differences in the outcomes or the treatment? Yeah, so it's been a while for this work that we have done and, and at the time we looked at, and there was lots of interactions, but we have interactions between the ethnicity and race and the location and and we have published this work in pa in a paper that is one of the papers which was really uh, well described that it. it's published in health services research and that was back in 2014 and we looked at the uh, and the interaction and what does interaction say that if you're given this characteristics and you live in a certain area so the outcomes like that you're going to experience when it comes to breast cancer uh, outcomes. So we look at uh, one uh, five year survival. Usually it's like it depends on the length of the survival. You would look, for example, for breast cancer, it's five and 15 years. And we looked at the those outcome disparities. And I might not remember the very details of those uh, of those studies because it's been a while, but uh, I can certainly say it's like that study and many others, they have the documented disparities by the uh, this, uh, when the stage of cancer. So the stage of cancer is earlier stage that you detect the cancer, you have better survival. So it's directly related when you'll have survival. And it's not only our study, there's tons of studies like the better access that you have to the screening, the better uh, you're gonna detect cancers earlier. And there is, so now I'm in Chicago and there's lots of studies that have been published in Chicago in that area too. Great. So let's fast forward then and go to the work you've been doing on a, on a chronic mm -hmm. disease um, and tell us, you know, what are some of the core findings that you have uh, discerned at this point? Yeah, so when it comes to chronic kidney disease, we have done lots of areas uh, of looking at what's the outcomes and implications. I do have another, uh, we have an appoint, uh, appointment with the Heinz VA hospital, which is next door to us to Loyola. And we have looked at the Heinz VA, we have looked at physician behaviors that impact uh, whether patients get the prescriptions or not. And we looked at it in the context of statin. And statin is a medication that you would take for cholesterol lowering. And it's, it's, it's based on guidelines. And we looked at why physicians had different prescribing patterns for a statin for this medication that is uh, you have to take it when you're in chronic kidney disease. So we look at uh, the disparities, what these patients with chronic kidney disease are experiencing and what's next. So little bit background in uh, health inequities research. <laughs> So the stage one is to document it and try to understand it, but then we have to take an action to try to take a difference. So that's where we're, we have been focusing a lot of in recent years, and we have another project as well. So looking at the patient level characteristics and patient level uh, interventions of how to improve the outcomes for these patients. So, but... But the missing piece for me is, did you find differences 
in treatment approach of statin by race, ethnicity, or different grouping variables? Yeah, so that's a really good question because we looked at this at the VA, like, uh, and this is national VA data set, and we did not find like for statin because the VA is pretty homogeneous and there were no racial ethnic disparities. So uh, among race at the VA, but there were some that like there was, at, and again, like, this is research in 2016, and there was differences where physicians needed to prescribe and they have not prescribed, but there was no differences by race or ethnicity or any of those factors. Okay. Well, I mean, uh, not to be Pollyannish, but that's encouraging, right? I mean, we that's that's the finding that one would hope for. Um, given, so, so you had mentioned that once one understands sort of the parameters that influence good treatment method or practice, uh, the next step is to take action to improve it even further. Where, where has that taken you so far? Yeah, so we're excited about a new study that we're looking at. So as I was mentioning, there's at the physician level, and we have done some interventions at the VA for the physician level, for example, uh, uh, decision support systems for physicians. But now looking at the patient level too, there is uh, there's literature about self-management of lots of these conditions that come with chronic kidney disease, as I was mentioning, uh, diabetes, hypertension. And we're looking at what's the role of the patient for uh, self-management. And I have I have to say that we know self-management works for chronic uh, for chronic any chronic diseases it works but we're not in the health system good at doing it so we're still the science is still developing of how we can make patients manage their condition better and improve uh, improve uh, uh, shared decision making with their provider so there is that disconnect yet because we know we know that will improve the outcomes but what are the tools that we're going to give to these patients to improve their self management and one tool we're looking at like health information technology how patients can use technology to improve their self management and one of the pathways if you look how that happens is by shared decision making with their provider so when they take action into the managing for their health so it's two way here the pay, uh, and the provider as well they have to understand that they're equal partner in their health and have that communication with their patient I think what's exciting about your work, I mean, there's many things, but one is, you know, which the, which our audience, uh, I, I think it's helpful for them to, to know, is you're working at the structural policy level. In other words, you're asking the questions, not simply what are the socio-ecological factors that might lead to an outcome, but what are the, the structural factors like the way a thousand doctors administer a treatment like statin or the way in which technology interfaces with tens of thousands of patients, whether through the VA or some other system, so that if you make an improvement to the system, it'll improve healthcare. Uh, it's a great topic. And, uh, and with that said, in a little bit, we will return with Dr. Marcosian, who will tell us a little bit about her life story and how her undergraduate education and beyond set the table for her to have an exciting research career. This is Public Health America. I'm your host, Dr. William Latimer. Welcome back to Public Health America. 
I'm your host, Dr. William Latimer. So Talar, in this segment, we talk a little bit about the life history of the guest. And I always start with the same question. Um, where were you born and what were some of your formative experiences? Yeah, so I'm uh, Armenian originally, but and born and raised in Lebanon. So that's uh, that's like uh, some of the background and growing up in Lebanon. So we had I had to face so many challenges, like getting our education done with everything going on there. So and I did my I went to school and I was French educated and then went to American University of Beirut. That's where my mom used to uh, hold a position and I, uh, I studied at this American university. And uh, my undergrad was in biology. I was always interested and my, my parents like had medical background. So I was always fascinated with medicine. And uh, the nice part is that I always had as well a math oriented background, uh, like mind mindset. So uh, I did a, my master's, like after finishing my undergrad in biology, I wanted to combine my both interests. So that's why I did my master's in hospital administration. So at the time when I did my master's, like the master's in public health and uh, hospital administration, that was the name. Nowadays is health policy and management. So at the time I did my master's in hospital administration and I did an internship at American University of Beirut Medical Center. That's where I worked with the hospital director. He was this director from New York actually, who moved uh, to AUB and he was training and he had this vision of the next like people trained in healthcare having this more public health oriented mindset. So once I was like, and I got my first like job at that university, but then I felt I wanted to do something different, right? Rather than a hospital environment, which is great. You can do a lot like in a uh, hospital environment and while facing the patients, I felt that I need to do something health policy related and continue my studies. So that's why I decided to do a PhD in health policy and management and also growing up in an environment where it's resource, uh, it's not like there's no unlimited resources, right? As in background and cost, cost effectiveness and uh, economic background, you know that resources are not, uh, are finite. So that's where I started thinking about, okay, maybe I should continue my PhD in trying to see something related to cost effectiveness. That's when I applied to my PhD program and I got accepted and moved to US to study. That's great. I mean, boy, oh boy, you just said a lot. You, you, just, you just covered a lot. Um, if I may, let me bring you back to those early years. Um, so, and I, I asked this um, to some extent naively, uh, is, there, is there a large Armenian population in Lebanon? What was it like? Uh, it sounds like you went to a French speaking uh, K through 12, what we call K through 12, but then went to English speaking undergrad. Um, just, I, I'd love to hear more about those, those early experiences and maybe let's put it this way. What's one challenge you faced and what's one protective factor that you experienced that helped get you to the next level? That's really a nice question uh, that you asked. So what was growing up in Lebanon? Uh, so uh, my parents themselves had lots of challenges to receive university education. And we always appreciated uh, having that education. 
and I was always supported with my parents. And my parents also had the international mindset where you have to learn as many languages as possible. So it was, uh, they sent uh, my sister and I, so in Lebanon, you have schools that are French oriented and you have schools that are English oriented in addition to the language, which is Arabic. So my mom wanted to send us to French uh, oriented schools so we can learn French as well as Armenian, which is our uh, uh, language at home so my sister and i learned french and armenian and arabic but then uh, we could have uh, we would go to american university of peru that was totally english university and one of the challenge i remember my first class was organic chemistry and i went like to this organic chemistry class i was like i don't even understand what the teacher is saying to understand the material so that was one thing i was i was like i don't i don't understand anything but then if you look now, like I teach in English, I write in English, I publish in English. And one thing though, it's like what I've learned in my life, practice. And I was never good in writing, really. My mom used to struggle teach me writing. Math, yes, writing, no. But then like, and even like in French, in every language, but lots of practice, lots of reading, and now, like you see, it's like we, it's we, it's we write all our proposals and papers and doing the appropriate grammar. So it's just that, like one thing that I always say, even if you experience challenges, and it's just lots of practice and experience would get you there. That's great. So I mean, I, I think diligence, perseverance, practice, uh, these are. Uh, so important and perhaps uh, virtues that are not sufficiently extolled uh, in, you know, uh, in, you know, the annals of what gets you through is just hard work, diligence, stick-to-itiveness. And clearly that is a part of your story. Um, tell us, expand a little bit at your undergraduate. So you're doing English for the first time. I can't even imagine what a challenge that would be and that, and obviously you surmounted it. Um, were there key, was there a key mentor? You, you mentioned you did some experiential learning, like what were the elements of your undergraduate experience that you would say were the most instrumental to you figuring out your next step and developing the skills that enable you to do the great work you do today? So one thing I really want to mention here so, and it sounds something like, what is she talking about? But it makes sense, at least to me, is make sure you have fun in everything you do, even in work. So make sure you follow something you really like to do. And that like drives where I am all the time. I always make sure I have fun in what I do and I'm passionate about and follow the path that leads where I really want to be next. And, and one thing which is really important, always speak to people. And I've learned that always, uh, even you're shy, sometimes you can be shy. Sometimes you can have like, oh my, uh, this person will respond to me or not. But that's what I've learned. So I had good role models where I did my undergrad in an American university where I had mentors like professors who were uh, from uh, US and doing like this type of work where I used to go and ask questions. And I was that type of student like who asked questions and because they're gonna write their recommendations for you and they're gonna tell you what you don't know. So I, as I was mentioning, when I was considering a PhD study, I made sure to ask lots of questions to those professors who had background in uh, uh, in US and always like at every juncture, and I still do, by the way, I still do, always make sure that you're picking topics, you're doing things, you're doing the next thing, which is, fun for you and you have passion because that's the only way you can keep going and you're gonna have failure but but it just the next day you're up and you're doing your work because you really like what in what you do and i think that's what i did that's great 
so two points to emphasize here, I think. You 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 only alluded to it in a line, but you're going to have failure. I think in mentoring students uh, at every institution I've been, you know, uh, I'm convinced that they look at us as faculty and think we've never failed. And what I educate them about is for every grant I got, there's two or three I didn't. Oh, and, yes. <laughs> and, and so a big part about long-term success is, I wouldn't even say coming back from failure, uh, failure, but just recognizing that you can't win every time. And, oh, definitely. And being, and, and obviously that's embedded in your message. The other thing, and I think it may sound uh, a bit hackneyed, but I couldn't agree more. And that is love what you do. And what I would suggest to the audience is, is that what an undergraduate education, and in your case, a graduate education provides you is the opportunity to have a profession where you can love what you do, where you do get, let's just say, it's not like you get 100% choice, but you get a heck of a lot more choice over your own destiny. And it's your education that sets the table for that choice and then to love what you do. We have a, about a minute left. Um, Talar, if you were to give one or two uh, kernels of advice to a young person in the Bronx or a non-traditional age uh, prospective student in the Bronx, uh, who's thinking about going to college but isn't sure it's the right thing for them? What would you? What would that be? All right. So I must say this: as if you guys have watching the news, you see there's lots of chat coming up, like in in this our generation, next generations, and I think the only way is to to uh, face these threats is by educating ourselves and having the skills necessary and learning the tools. Because as you mentioned very nicely, an undergrad degree, it's, it's lots of things, is first getting to think differently, getting to know more people, getting to know more friends, making connections, it's education, it's degree, but it's also, it, it, it opens up though how you frame you, how you think. And there's lots of very much need for us to innovate and to do things differently. And we must, we must do things differently. And also, as you mentioned, not being afraid to fail. I think one of the things that all of us do is before jumping up is being afraid to fail, maybe starting a school, maybe innovating on a project, asking funding. It's like, what if, if I fail? And having that mindset that risk taking does need like taking in account that I might fail. And what I've learned that even if you fail, so what, you'll come up from it. Having that confidence that even if you fail, you're gonna get out of there. Even coming me to here to study by myself in US, I always thought that like, Oh, what happens if I can't like do it? I'm by myself. What do I do? But then again, like just do it and see what it takes you. And it's really important and shapes you who you are being a very totally different by the education and by the experiences of meeting new people, meeting new mindset of thinking. That's great. I want to thank Dr. Marcosian. I want to thank our viewers for tuning in. I'm your host, Dr. William Latimer. See you next time on Public Health America. Take care.